Greetings, I'm Frederick, the Micro-Hobbyist. In this second episode, we'll cover the basic circuits required to run and test the CPU. Take out your breadboards, as it's time to unleash the 6309. In the previous video, I gave you a sneak peek into the core objectives of Project Logic Spark 09. The mission? To craft a retro computer capable of smoothly running a tried and true operating system. On the menu today, we're rolling up our sleeves and getting down to the basics. We're serving up a platter of tasks from powering up the breadboard to introducing a humble reset IC tossing in an external clock circuit, and finally connecting the dots for testing the processor. I contemplated scripting this video series in a step-by-step, wire-by-wire, tutorial-style format. However, after two pre-production attempts, I quickly concluded that it would drastically slow down the project's overall pace, and consume more time to produce videos than the actual project development. So I'll try something different than what I propose in the series intro. Let me know how that works for you, and I'll try to adjust accordingly. It shouldn't affect the overall experience though. Let's start with the power section. Here's a breakdown of our circuit. The barrel connector is connected to a regulated 5V DC source. The switch is a typical on-off single-pole double-throw switch. The capacitor, in parallel to the output of a power supply, is used for stabilizing the output voltage. It smooths ripples, stores energy, filters out noise, and improves transient responses. The LED simply serves as an indicator to show if power is applied to the circuit. The dropping resistor is crucial to control the current flowing through the LED, ensuring it stays within safe operating limits. Moving on to the reset section, we are going to use a reset and voltage supervisor IC that is the size of a small transistor. I've been using the DS1813 for years, they are quite useful. Here's a breakdown of the functionality for this circuit. When the DS1813 detects an out-of-spec voltage, it generates an internal power fail signal, triggering an active low reset. Once VCC returns within specifications, the reset signal stays low for approximately 150 milliseconds, ensuring stability for the power supply and processor. Additionally, the IC monitors a push button at the output. When it is pressed, it brings the reset line low, initiating a reset. Upon releasing the button, the reset signal remains low for 150 milliseconds. An optional LED has been added to indicate when reset is active. Side note. The output of the DS1813 is open drain, thereby allowing an external device to initiate a reset if needed. According to the datasheet, the 6309 requires the reset line to be held low until both clock signals are fully operational. For our needs, the 150 millisecond reset delay is ample time to allow the clocks to settle. Now let's delve into the clock circuit. One thing to consider. There are two versions of the processor, the 6309 and the 6309E, where E stands for Enhanced. Although they share software compatibility, the E version introduces some performance enhancement. However, the most significant aspect is the method of generating clock signals. With the non-E version, the signals are generated internally, while the Enhanced version, they are generated externally. Since we're using the Enhanced 6309E, we'll design the clock circuit based on its datasheet with a few modifications. For now, we'll skip the optional clock stretching circuit. The schematic calls for 74LS76 JK flip-flops. Unfortunately, this series is hard to come by, so we'll use 74HCT112 instead. I'm also replacing the 74LS04 inverters with a 74HCT14 Schmidt trigger inverter to clean up the signal. Now let's understand how this circuit functions. The oscillator generates a continuous stream of high-frequency square wave pulses. In this case, 4 MHz, 
but will increase the speed of the clock later down the road. In this configuration, the JK flip-flops divide the oscillator's frequency by 4, resulting in two synchronized signals that are 90 degrees out of phase. This is what's known as a quadrature clock. The signals are then cleaned up by two Schmidt trigger inverters to provide the final clock signals represented as E and Q. In essence, the resulting clock frequency for the CPU is 1 MHz. And now for the CPU test rig. The approach involves hard coding the no operation instruction onto the data bus using the opcode hex12. This test does exactly what it suggests, nothing, while continuously incrementing the address bus in a binary counting pattern. An LED connected to address line 15 will blink consistently and endlessly during this process. This straightforward test serves as a visual confirmation that the CPU functions in its most basic capacity. Let's test the design on the breadboard. Be wary of low quality breadboards as they often fail, complicating debugging. I recommend busboard prototype systems BB830, the same type used by Ben Eater. Let's look at each section. Power is connected with a switch to the breadboard. Reset is active on power up or when the reset button is pressed. Clock is generated via the oscillator and these two ICs. And finally, the CPU is wired up with an LED so we can see it blink. Side note, in this case I'm using an LED with a built-in resistor. Let's activate the circuit. Power LED turns on, optional reset LED turns on for a fraction of a second, and if we push reset we have the same outcome. The clock does its thing, and the LED connected to the processor is responding to the hard-coded no operation instruction. The fact that the LED blinks suggests that the chip appears to be operational, however it doesn't guarantee it can detect counterfeit chips. This will be clearer when we begin coding and testing at higher clock speeds, although it is a preliminary indication that it works. The astute among you may have noticed small blue bypass capacitors near VCC pins of each IC. As stated previously, this helps filter noise and improves transient response. Additionally, there are two larger capacitors, both placed at the end of each power rail acting as a reserve to counter voltage dips. It's advisable to have one on each power rail. Thank you for joining me on this journey. We've covered the basic circuits to get started and even tested the processor. Next, we're stepping up to wire a flash ROM for our first program. To balance video production with actual project building, I've shifted the series from a detailed guide to a narrated overview. I'm eager to hear your thoughts. Please share your feedback in the comments below and let me know how this format works for you. Excited about what lies ahead? Like, subscribe, hit the notification bell and brace yourself for the upcoming episodes of 6309 Unleashed, 8 Bits and Beyond.